All right. So, welcome to the SEP Developer Monthly. So, my name is Leonardo Vaz, but everyone calls me just Leo. I'm the new SEP Community Manager. And we have the this meeting from August. Um, Sage would like to, to continue talking about the... Sure. Um... I don't know, there's not a whole lot, oops, there's not a whole lot to update. Um, I should want to give a really quick um, Luminous update. Uh, I think we're getting really close to release. Um, we, Josh and I did a bug scrub this morning and marked the last few Rados bugs um, that we consider blockers to be immediate. Uh, about half of them, not half of them, some of them already have fixes ready. They're just a handful of the ones we want to either diagnose and demote or fix. Um, so I'm hoping for a Luminous release. Um, beginning of next week, which will be good. Um, and then we can head off towards Mimic. Um, I guess that's about it. There'll be a few things that um, are still sort of in, people have been working on that we'll probably keep backporting to Luminous. Um, some of the manager modules are sort of trivially separable and we'll get backboarded like the balancer module that I'm working on, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but. Uh, Otherwise, I'm pretty excited about Luminous um, and looking forward to getting it out there and in people's hands. Um, I guess that's all, all I have, really. Uh, let's see, Leo just posted the link to the agenda, uh, which has quite a few items, so we'll probably want to um, get moving and get through it. Um, John, do you want to do you want to start? I sort of signed you up for this. I don't know if you've actually prepared anything. Um. Uh, yeah, so sure. Um, I'll just touch on the the stuff that's been added very recently okay. um, in the interest of publicizing it a bit. Um, so in the past couple of months, we've added a bunch of stuff that is aimed at making Ceph easier to use and enabling other people to make Ceph easier to use. Um, the most visible thing um, is the new web dashboard, which is just the module that's just called dashboard um, in the Ceph tree. So I'm just going to share my web browser window here. So hopefully everyone can see that. Um, the idea of this is not to um, dethrone any of the various Ceph management GUI projects that exist, um, but to provide a sort of basic, simple one that's baked in so that people who just need a GUI, any GUI, um, have one, uh, but also so that people who want to implement interesting functionality have a place to do it. So if you there's like a cool graph that you want to expose or the status of your feature, you want to add a page for it so that you can show it off to people. This is kind of an easy place to do that. Um, it's easy to do because it's in the tree. Um, you can add it alongside <clears throat> the features as you work on them. So currently, this is pretty basic. You've got a, a front page, which is pretty much a web version of what you get when you type set status. Um, you have a, a list of servers <clears throat> showing you what's running on them list of OSDs with some usage and little sparkline graphs for the read and write activity. Um, there's an RBD section courtesy of JSON. Um, this is all blank for me because I don't have any mirroring demons or anything set up. Um, and there's a CFS page that will show you a, a page for each of your file systems with a sort of slightly friendlier um, view of the status than you get at the command line. So almost everything you see here is just getting pulled from the in-memory stats and objects that Manager has. Um, so the module is pretty simple. There are a few things that are fetched remotely live. So if I was to click the detail button next to the uh, clients bit, well, I don't have any clients mounted at the moment, but if I did, um, this would be populated via the Manager module doing a, the equivalent of a Ceph tell sending a mon command um, out to, well, not a mon command, an m command message out to the daemon to get the list of clients. So you can do that stuff from the dashboard as well. 
The some of the stuff here is enabled by new stuff um, under the hood. So notably, you can see the status of RGW and RBD demons now. Um, the RGW stuff isn't in the dashboard yet. Um, I think someone will probably create an RGW page pretty soon. Um, that used to not be possible because the manager didn't know anything about RGW demons. There's now a new structure in the manager called the service map. So that's accessible um, to modules, but it's also accessible from the command line. There are a few new commands along the lines of um, quick look at Ceph help, uh, service status, service dump. And now when you look at the output of Ceph status, you also see a line for um, RGW demons. So I'm just going to show my window again. Star cluster. But when I do set status, there's now a line for RPW along with the OSDs and NDSs and so on. <clears throat> so you can populate the service map from anything that uses LibRados. So there's a new, a couple of new calls in LibRados that let you send a, a dictionary of metadata um, when you start up and then a status dictionary to show your, your health as you go on. So for example, the RBD mirror daemon, it can give you status on whether it's keeping up with its queues or falling behind or whatever. And then you can have things in manager modules that interpret that information, either to put it on screen in front of the user or to generate health messages from it, that kind of thing. The other thing that's gone in to enable stuff in the dashboard um, is to list RBD images actually used to be pretty hairy because you didn't know which pools to look at. Um, you didn't know upfront which pools were RBD pools, so you didn't know where to go and run the RBD command to go and list images. So there's a new concept of application tags that apply to pools. This is pretty transparent most of the time, um, but you can also drive it manually. So there are these new commands, OSD pool, application, enable, disable. And those are sort of fancy names for adding a little string tag to the pool in the OSD map. Um, so to say this is an RBD pool, this is a SEPFS pool, or if you have an external application, you can use that to mark it as being in use by your application as well. That also enables us to be a little bit safer inside some of the monitor commands. So we can see if a pool is already in use by a different application before trying to use it for something like RBD or CFS. Let me see what else. Um, there have been lots of improvements to logging. So a few people on IRC in the list have already noticed that um, it used to be that if you type Ceph-W, um, which follows the cluster log, you would pretty much just see a continuous um, spew of PG map summaries. Um, which was quite useful some of the time if you were just trying to watch the performance of the system and see that it had some activity. Um, but it was pretty unfriendly and pretty hard to read. So the PG map SPU is now off by default. Um, and there are a bunch of new log messages that are emitted um, by things like the OSD monitor and the manager mon monitor, the MDS monitor, when demons change state. So that rather than uh, having to sort of infer what's going on by looking at the periodic dumps of maps, you get explicit sort of plain English messages that, that tell you that. And there's a new page in the developer documentation with some guidance on how messages like that should be phrased for users. Uh, the other big new thing in the logs is that all of the health statuses that you can have, so all of the various things that can happen at the top of your set status, um, now generate log messages as well. So it used to be that if you had something go unhealthy on your system, that would happen. And if you happen to look at self set status while it was bad, you would know about it. But if you didn't and it went healthy again, there was no indication of that anywhere in your log. So now all of the possible uh, places where we raise health alerts, um, they're called health checks now, have a unique code. And when a health alert or health check, I have to keep getting it right, um, of that type gets raised, um, you get a log message saying this condition is now failing um, 
And then when it clears, you get another message saying, this is now clear. So that hopefully makes it a lot easier for people to interrogate um, the log to work out what happened when on their system. So you see those in your logs as well. The um, JSON format of the health of the health output has changed to enable this. So health information used to just be strings. Um, it's not anymore. So I'll just show you what the new one looks like. But actually, I'll make the system go unhealthy first. I'll go no out so that we'll get the simple health warning for that. And I've got a health warning that says no out flags are set. If I go and use the new log last command to see the recent history of the cluster log, um, well, I've actually only got one recent line here, and it's the uh, message to the log telling me that a health check failed. So this is a generic thing. Every time one of these fails, you get a method message that says health check failed, and then the text of what appeared in set status. <clears throat> and if I do Ceph health format JSON pretty, and the new structure is that there is a checks um, object where the key is the code. Um, so there are a bunch of these all capital letter short strings, which are the, the codes for health checks. Um, and there, there's a new page in the documentation that lists all of them. And then each of these has the sort of good old familiar severity and message. Um, I'm actually running a slightly old version here. Um, this has changed again ever so slightly the last minute before we released Luminous so that the message now, rather than just being a string, we have a, an object called summary, which has a message attribute. Um, that's to make it extensible so that we can add more fields post Luminous without um, breaking backwards compatibility again. If you have tools that need the old format of the health output, there is a um, setting that you can set to make the monitors um, output the old format alongside the new format. So you just get both sets of fields in the JSON output. So let me see, that's health checks, logging. Uh, there are some log messages and um, health checks that have been quietened. Um, so you used to get individual health messages for each set of, um, with each unhealthy PG state that existed in the system, which um, meant that in practice, when you pull the drive or whatever, you would tend to get like, 10 lines of output in Ceph status um, for all the various different unhealthy states that PGs were in. Those are now grouped um, into a much smaller set of possible health checks. Um, so there's like a PG degraded, PG availability, um, and PG damaged health check. Um, and the various different PG states get assigned to one of those. So you have a much shorter output to your Ceph status. Uh, you do still have access, obviously, to all the detail um, if you just, you know, go and use the existing PG commands to go look at it. Uh, and also during initial cluster setup, um, there are a bunch of health checks, which you used to trigger during setup of the cluster, um, complaining about not having enough PGs or OSDs being offline or whatever. And they've all been sort of massaged, um, so that they don't trigger under those circumstances. So there are checks that will now only complain about having a bad number of PGs if there are actually some objects in the pool and that kind of thing. So that when, when your system initially comes up, you don't see a bunch of scary warning and error messages. Sage, what am I forgetting? Um, that's most of it. There's the capabilities are simplified. Um, the other manager module, you show the, the manager FS module, status module, maybe? Um, oh, yeah. So there was a, uh, there's a module that's actually always been there, but it, it wasn't switched on by default before. Um, hopefully it's switched on by default here. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is a module that was kind of mainly written as a demonstrator for manager to begin with, um, but it's now um, switched on by default. Um, it's just called the status module, and it has two commands, fs status and the other one's just called osd status. 
possibly. Yeah, there you go, which give you sort of slightly friendlier, colorized um, summary views. So th these are, this, this, this isn't meant to blow your mind that we have these couple of commands. Um, it's meant to make you think, hey, I could add something cool there. Um, so when you have, you know, stuff you, you would like to monitor um, for the features that you're working on, then it's ridiculously easy to go and add these commands. It's all just Python and like a few tens of lines of Python in one of these existing, whether it's in the status module or the dashboard module or wherever, um, or your own module, you, you can create this stuff really easily now. Yep, and I guess the, the bottom line is that you can implement commands that are in the normal CLI command namespace. Um, right, it used to be that you had to do set tell manager and then whatever to invoke your Python module, that's all gone now. So the, from the user's point of view, they can't tell whether the command they're using is coming from a manager module or it's like built into the monitor. Config options maybe? Oh yes. So the internals of how config options work um, have changed. Um, you may or may not have noticed this. Um, there used to be a file called configopts.h that had um, a whole bunch of preprocessor macro calls in. Um, that's gone, um, or rather it's been renamed to legacy configopts.h in order to have a, a nicer C++ class definition of all the options, um, which is now in options.cc. Um, that's not just for fun. Um, the reason for making the change is so that we can add a lot more fields um, to the options, things like minimum, maximum thresholds, um, <clears throat> human readable description strings. So all of the options now have a description string and a long description string, which currently aren't being used to build the documentation, but ultimately will be. Um, and that stuff's all available um, at runtime through a new config help command. Um, so now if I do uh, even zero config help, I get this huge um, list of all of the possible options in the system and all of the metadata um, about them. You'll notice most of the descriptions are blank at the moment. Um, so the infrastructure has gone in. But the um, the work of actually going through and like typing all the descriptions in is still ongoing, um, and that should be fairly easy to backport to Luminous, even if folks don't get around to writing all their doc strings in before then. It might um, be worth mentioning the diff config diff too. That's new. Oh, is that diff? Is that new? Yeah, oh, that's I was already there when I started messing around with this. Yeah, but it's it's new since Jewel, I think. I, I haven't actually used that, Sage. Why don't you explain just, that? Uh, just instead of help type diff, it just dumps the config settings that are set that differ from the defaults. So those are the ones that matter, basically. <laughs> so cool. when previously you'd have to go do config show and it'd show every config option. They're like more than a thousand. It wasn't terribly helpful. This will just tell you the ones that are have been modified, which is usually what you want to know. It's a pretty big list right now because this is a vstart cluster and it sets up a bazillion things. But on a real cluster, it's usually a very short, short list. Um, so the, the consequence for folks working on the code is that um, because these options are now defined, um, uh, well, they are they're no longer preprocessor defined, which means that options that you add in options.cc won't exist as C++ class members on the global config object. You have to actually call dot get um, with the name of your option to go get it. Um, this is also, as well as um, adding lots of metadata, this is a precursor to the movement, which hopefully will happen in a reasonably near future, to store all the config options centrally on the monitors um, and then have all of the daemons consume them from there rather than each loading them locally from a, from a text file. So this is sort of step one of making the options easy to consume from user interfaces and scripts and stuff. And step two is giving you that central um, store of all the options that um, would be much easier to sort of get and set from if you're putting a, a friendly interface on top of Ceph. Uh, 
Um, oh yeah, and there's uh, a new command for using all the versions in the system. Um, this is your command sage. What is it? Just set versions. Oh yeah. Yep. There you go. So you can you can imagine this is going to be pretty useful um, if you're in the middle of an upgrade or you're dealing with a user who might not be 100% sure about what version they're running or might not be completely accurate about what version they're running. Um, this is a very quick way to just uh, interrogate that. There's a features one too, test features. That's similar, it pays attention to the feature bits implemented by clients that are connected. So it, um, the knowing what the demons are is, is less useful. The main one here is the clients. So you can tell if you have Firefly clients connected or you know, dual clients or whatever. Interesting for what release each connection is based on the, the feature bits that it supports. Do we do we have helper functions for turning the, the feature bits into a list of strings or something? We do, yep. Those numbers don't mean anything to me. Yeah, no, they don't. No, don't mean anything to anyone. <laughs> They're pretty hard to interpret, even if you know what they mean. Oh, and it's probably worth mentioning the the OSD destroy and OSD purge stuff that Joao did. Um, so that that was like a while ago now, but it sort of fits in this general category of commands that are easier to use and make make things easier. So those are for OSD replacement and OSD removal without typing as many commands and without doing as much data mm -hmm. movement. The the main thing is that well there the, so when you're when you have a failed disk and you want to replace it, um, it's usually best to preserve the same OSD ID so that the crush mapping doesn't shuffle data around. Um, and so those commands allow you to do that. So you can do destroy, which marks the OSD as, it sets a flag that says it's been destroyed and removes its like set executes and stuff, but it leaves it in the crush map. And then when you do set disk prepare, you can pass the OSD ID argument to pass in that old OSD ID to reuse, and it'll check if it's something that it can reuse because it's been previously destroyed. And if so, it'll let you re reprovision it with a new Cephex key, yada, yada. So it's useful both for failed disks and also if you're doing any conversion of um, file store to blue store OSDs, you can also use that command. And then there's another one purge that'll just like remove all trace of the OSD, remove it from the crush map, remove all the keys from config key, and so on. All the like four different places you used to have to touch. All right, I think, I think I've talked for long enough. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the stuff that I've just gone through? Um, could we change the features to hex? So if we needed to look at a bit, <laughs> we could see it. <laughs> Can you do hex in JSON? Mm, no, you can't. You'd have to output it as a string. <laughs> OK, we could do a, a separate field that's like, a string of it printed in hex, because yeah, it's, the feature bits are traditionally very annoying to interpret in decimal. Um, all right, any other questions about that? All right, uh, the next thing on here is the balance, balancer module. Um, let me just paste the link in here as a quick there's a pad with some notes I made when I was about to write it, and then I wrote it. Um, still up to date. Um, the main thing here is let me make sure my cluster is in the wrong directory. Make sure my terminal. Um, so the idea here is to make a um, a set of commands that run all the all the balancing code. So there used to be the reweight visualization command built into the monitor um, that generally worked, but it was pretty fragile, and you had to sort of trust that it was going to do the right thing. Um, but it was still pretty primitive, um, and we have a bunch of new tools in stuff now that let us do a much better job of doing optimization of the crush weights and layout and distribution and so on. Um, but um, 
but they're not easy to use. Um, so the idea with the manage, manager, the balancer module is that they'll just be a, a set of commands that sort of make it um, much, much simpler to use. Um, so can you guys, is it showing my screen, my terminal? I'll make it big. Um, so it's a set of new commands. Um, the basic idea is that once the module is enabled, you can do balance or you can set the mode to up map. It's the only one that's currently working right now. Um, there's a status that tells you whether it's working. Um, eventually, you'll just, get a, you'll just say balancer on and it'll just in the background at all times check your distribution and sort of make small changes as needed to make sure that you're evenly distributing all your data across all your devices. And that's sort of the hands off approach that eventually we'll want to get to. That's not there yet. Um, but uh, in, the, in the course of implementing this, um, built it so you can sort of break it down to a series of steps and actually tell what it's going to do and make sure it does the right thing. So the idea is that you run an optimized command, you give it a name of the plan that you're gonna do, it's called it foo. It'll decide what that, what that is. It'll run the optimizer, take a bunch of steps. Show will actually show you what the plan wanted to do. So in this case, since my mode is up map, it's using a new PG up map exception list. These are the changes that the, that the plan wants to make. Um, you can go to execute foo to actually say, okay, that looks fine, I'm gonna do it. Um, and then here you can run it again. I make a new plan for additional changes um, and so on. Um, and now after that step, it should be completely balanced because I didn't have that many PGs. Yeah, you'll notice there are exactly 24 PGs, so it's done. There's no, just why that plan was empty. There's nothing really to do. Um, then there's a new um, eval command that's only half implemented right now, <clears throat> but it basically does all the, the statistical analysis to make sure, to figure out what that distribution of data is, um, figure out what the standard deviation is, whether it's above or below what's sort of expected. Um, and to give you, eventually it'll give you a score of how good the distribution is. Um, and the idea basically in doing this is that all of the infrastructure is being built into the manager uh, module interface so that um, you can you can sort of um, in a sandbox figure out what changes you would want to make and then evaluate what the result would be and it will score it so that you can build an optimizer that runs in there. That is, for example, to do a gradient descent on um, the crush weights um, to get to a better distribution. Out of that, it would have a proposed set of new weights that, are, that it would have as part of the plan you can see if that score is better than <clears throat> better than your current cluster and if so you could execute that plan and then it'll actually optimize those weights um, so still work in progress um, but getting that infrastructure in place um, and trying to do it in a way that makes sure it sort of takes into consideration all the complexities that have been previously ignored um, so you'll notice this breaks things down by root which is essentially roots in the crush tree um, default in this case, and then also by pool. And it does all the analysis analyses um, for both of those. So for example, if you use the new crush device class feature, where you have um, OSDs tagged as hard disks and some tagged as SSDs, and you have crush rules that distribute just across those devices, when it does its analysis of the data distribu distribution, it'll take that into consideration. So it's looking at the expected distribution of objects for each of those sort of subtrees of that hierarchy that you're placing data on and the actual, and it'll optimize against that instead of sort of conflating and confusing the two. Um, so I think that's looking pretty good. Um, the main, I guess, consequence of that is that we, we no longer will sort of do what the old optimizer was, where we just look at the actual utilization on each OSD based on the like data fest results um, and optimize against that um, because we want to have this, the ability to um, model what our change is going to do. And so instead, this is going to have an in-memory, all the infrastructure so that you can say, if I make this change and I move these PG ar PGs around, I know how big that PG is and how much data is going to move. And so I can sort of predict what the usage is going to be after that, um, which is all which is all good. Um, it'll be a little bit, we'll have to be a little bit careful because the OMAP stuff isn't totally um, accounted for currently, um, but I think we can make the model re reasonably accurate um, and do that. So that's that's about it for, for that. I'm still in progress, um, but I expect to, once it's working, to backport that to, to Luminous because it's all just Python code in the 
in the manager. Um, so this will sort of be coming soon. Um, yeah, any questions about that? So how does it currently behave if you uh, give it a, a brand new OSD with, with weight zero? Does it like handle that? Um, sort of. Um, so the, it depends on what mode it's in. So in the upmap mode, it's um, it's just remapping PGs um, based on how, so to equalize the number of PGs based on the weight. Um, in all cases, it's it's throttled by how much data is misplaced. So um, the idea is that you set it at like 3% or something by default, and it'll only make small changes so that no more than 3% of the PGs are currently rebalancing and moving data around. So it can make it go slow, basically. Um, for the other mode where, which is probably the one that people are actually gonna use, the crush compat mode, which optimizes crush weights, um, it'll sort of inherit the ability to ramp up crush weights from zero to whatever the actual weight should be um, by starting them at zero. Um, and so all the pieces are there to do that, but that mode isn't really implemented yet. So, um, but eventually, yes, there'll be, a, the idea is that when you have a new OSD, you'll basically say that the target weight for this is the size of the device, you know, like four terabytes or whatever. Um, but it's um, the effective weight that it's actually using will start out at zero and then it'll slowly ramp that up and to try to hit that 3% threshold or whatever it is um, so that um, it'll slowly fill over time. So I guess I guess my main question here is just whether that, um, I think I sent an email to the list to you, whether the interface makes sense and the general approach makes sense um, or if there are any other things that I should be paying attention to to make sure that it can support um, as I put this together. I'm planning on making it so that people who are have been using the old method of the OSD weight reweight thing um, when they switch to the new balancer module and do the crush weight optimization, it'll it'll sort of back off the old corrections and as it starts using the new ones. Um, so it'll sort of have a smooth transition from those two mechanisms. Um, I can't think of other things that I need to pay attention to. Does the does the three percent threshold for misplaced objects, does that seem reasonable? Or seem like the right way to sort of throttle the whole thing? I think I'd worry less about the number of misplaced and more about how much peering has to happen in any one mass step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, it, it would be a that would be an upper bound, right? So if it's if it's targeting only some percentage of misplaced PGs that are going to be changing at once, then that'll be the maximum number that'll peer in each step. Yeah, that will peer in each step. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean we could have two thresholds. Also, it could like only do a half of it each time it takes a half of the max or whatever, just to make sure it doesn't like miscalculate an overshoot or something. That'd probably be a good idea anyway. I guess the only thing I'm not sure that that would take into consideration is if you have a cluster with like a thousand OSDs and you put in one OSD, that's like 0.1% of the data. Um, and so 3% is basically gonna be hammering on that one OSD. I wonder if we will also want like a per OSD threshold or something. And I don't know if it matters that much really because it's the um the all the existing recovery scheduling stuff is still there. So in theory you should be able to like say hundred percent of the data is misplaced and it's just gonna get scheduled in the background. Um but again, yeah, it's the peering <clears throat> it's the peering thing, I guess. So um 
Yeah. Okay. And I know you sent an email, but I'm the part where we don't measure OMAP is kind of scaring me because there are some clusters yeah. where that's a huge proportion of what'll be on some stuff. Yep. Yep. So the current code is um is basically mirroring the calculations for um the PG count for the number of objects and for the number of bytes. Um so um, it could be that in some cases we just count on if the pool is full of a map or something, then we would just balance objects instead of bytes. Um, the problem is that you can't then equate if you're having to mix the two. And when you're doing the crush compat thing, you have a single set of crush weights. And so you're actually optimizing based on the crush roots instead of the per, on a per pool basis. Um, so my hope is that we can, my plan is to eventually basically have it um, build a model of um, object average object cost on a per pool basis, um, where we would basically try to infer what the OMAP size is um, by doing trying to solve the <laughs> solve for the unknowns. Where I can see that the OSDs are using up this much metadata space, um, and I think I can infer from that that there's this much OMAP or something like that. Um, or at least if the like sort of the obvious model where it's zero, um, if that just disagrees with reality, where um, my model says that this OST should be at two percent and really it's at like forty percent, then I know that I don't understand where the usage is coming from, and then I can stop. Um, yeah, I wonder if another thing we want to get in before the release is we should at least be able to measure how much OMAP data is is in a you know so maybe we should yeah. start having. But in the PG stats. I was thinking about that. Yeah. Um, I keep forgetting to go and I want to, at the very minimum, I want to make sure that Blue Store reports how much, how big RocksDB is in that structure. Um, it doesn't know the difference between, um, at least from a bytes consumed perspective, between OMAP data and its internal metadata. Um, but it could if we use the, I think it can if we start using column families, but we haven't done that yet. So I think it's going to have to come later and be backboarded. Um, but in principle, yes, that would be, that would make that solving that equation to figure out, to build a model of what the object sizes are much more possible. Okay. Um, so the next subject here I put on here before expecting to, um, have sort of proposal, but it didn't. Um, so it, the the idea is just about auto tuning the PG num. Um, so this came up in one of the discussions um, on the usability call um, a couple weeks ago, um, and the question was basically if we can't merge PGs. Um, well, the motivation is eventually we want to have users not have to think about PG counts. So they have the system just automatically adjust them up or down as needed. The problem with that right now is that we can't merge PGs. Um, so the question was, if we can't do that, can we just, um, if we overshoot the PG count and we want to scale it back down, can we just adjust the PGP num, which is the placement, um, back down? And so the PGs are still separate but stored next to each other. Um, does that get us, is that almost as good? Um, and I, the, I think the answer is almost. <laughs> um, they're, still, um, they're still separate PGs, so you still have the twice as many um, pairing messages that go back and forth. Um, but the as far as data placement goes, it's all the same. Um, so the reliability implications don't change. Um, and if we change the way that the OSD is allocating memory to PG logs, then the memory footprint won't change that much. You'll have the like the per PG metadata that OSD is pretty small. It's really the PG log is the part that makes each PG consume a lot of memory. Um, but if we are smart about that so that it doesn't um, use up so much, it just has fewer PG log entries per PG, for example, um, then we could probably get much closer. Um, and so I think then, assuming that's um, not ideal, but it's um, still probably better than um, forcing all users to think very carefully about PGs and then getting it wrong, 
Um, then the question is, how do you make a set of um, policies and heuristics that sort of automatically choose a PG value dynamically and adjust it over time so that users don't have to think about it? Um, and I think I, I had some basic ideas. Um, you know, if you look at the number of objects or bytes in a pool compared to other pools, you can sort of infer what fraction of the total data of the cluster is in that pool. And you look at how many PGs total you want in the cluster, and you can sort of make that pool then be roughly the proportion of the total PG count that you want, something like that, um, at least as a starting point. Um, but I think John had some more specific ideas about how he wanted this to sort of look to a user. Um, I can't remember what you were saying that you wanted it to be sort of tied in with an application level directive so or something. My, my thinking was that we would want to not just um, respond to the size of the data in the pool, but get input from the user about how big they expect the pool to be, or at least what percentage of their cluster they expect the pool to use, um, so that in the relatively simple but probably quite common cases where someone has one or two applications using their whole cluster, we're not sort of running around adjusting PG num. Um, if we could have just originally been told by the user, like, hey, this is my RGW, I'm going to use half my cluster for it. You know, we could have just got it right to begin with if we if we let them give us that input. Mm -hmm. So for like taking RGW as an example, um, we we would want them to be able to say, um, here are the pools that I'm using for RGW. This is like the data one, this is going to be X percent of my cluster, and then have some kind of rule that says how big the various, or like for CFFS, how big the metadata pool should be as a proportion of the data pool um, as an initial guess. Um, and then the automatic adjustment sort of happens based on that input, right? So it would be like if they said, if they said they wanted 100 terabytes of ZFS and we have a rule that says 1% of that should be allocated to a metadata pool, then the PG count for the metadata pool would be that 1% fraction or more if they've actually exceeded what they thought they were going to use. You know? So it would like it would yeah. be the input would be the user's policy plus um, whatever we were measuring. And then we potentially could so that the the hard part of that is that users want to be able to effectively over provision or under provision depending on how you look at it um so they might say like i want this workload to go up to you know the size of my cluster and i want this workload to go up to the size of my cluster and we have to deal with that kind of input um mm -hmm. and decide whether that means well they both get half the number of pgs they would have got or maybe they both get more because the user is really telling us that he's going to add more OSDs later or that, that's where it gets complicated, I think. Yeah. But the, I think we shouldn't be deterred from doing the relatively simple case where the user tells us just here's an application and here's a number of petabytes. Um, and, and then we just, yeah, we just use that as the input. And, you know, if we get it in, in the minority of cases where that turns out not to be the right answer, they can override us. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like it'll be sort of a two-stage. If you have the the user input about what they expect, and then you have the what you actually measure in the cluster, and those are the two inputs for deciding how to adjust up or down. Um, you could, in the absence of the user input, you could also, if you have enough confidence about if there's enough utilization in the cluster, like you're at 
thirty percent capacity or something, and you have a pretty good idea what's happening, then you can make sort of conservative decisions about what to do. Also, yeah, it's the the thing that concerns me about um, doing it primarily based on used capacity is is how many times we're going to keep, you know, if, if we do it like by factors of two or something. On our, on our way from zero to filling up the cluster, we're going to go through a lot of factors of two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Probably as part um, of this, we also want to do some more work on throttling the actual work it's done during PG split. That it doesn't overload things nearly as much. We need to be doing it more automatically. Yeah. Well, I think that the split itself is pretty <clears throat> is pretty cheap now, I think. Like it it flushes some queues, but in blue store at least there's no <clears throat> the only work work that you actually do is um is splitting the PG log, which is just in memory, you know, it's a few thousand key value pairs or whatever. I guess the store might be cheap now. It's just the file store uh, movement is very expensive. Yeah. And the right, yeah, yeah, and the um, and of course the data movement. There's the data movement. That's that's pretty expensive. Right, but that that's handled by recovery, in general. Yeah. It's just the, yeah. the local thing in the past that's been the the big issue, I think. Yeah. Well, if we made it like you know jump by factors of four instead of factors by two, that's at least fewer steps, and it means that <clears throat> once you take a, any step, it's going to be like pretty long time before you like step back or make another step. Um, and probably being with that in a factor of four is pretty, it's good enough for the PG stuff. Well, again, don't forget about, it's not just data movement. There's a lot of peering that goes on, which means updates through the monitors, the OST maps. Um, yeah. And a lot more flushed and resent IO messages. Well, I think like the like the balancer, it once it decides to do something and it's actually making the change, it's not just going to like multiply it by four. It's going to like walk walk through it slowly so that there it bounds the number of PGs that are splitting or whatever at a time. Yeah. Um, the 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 sort of user input could also be a a, a restraint on splitting. So if if they've gone like a factor of two over how much data they said they were going to put in that set of application pools, mm -hmm. um, that could be more of a situation where we flag it to the user. Um, health warning. Yeah, a health warning or a I don't know, yeah. polite telephone call um, <laughs> where we <laughs> where we um, you know ask them because this should be, I mean, it should be not particularly frequent and yeah. if they've you know if they've set up their system and said i would like to provision you know a petabyte of rbd and they exceed their petabyte i think it would actually sort of line up with expectations that we would complain um but at the same time offer them the solution which is we would like to adjust your pg numbers Yeah, if each pool has like a, I mean, it already has properties like target max, bytes and max objects that we use for the cache sharing out of stuff or whatever. But if if they're basically like user input sizes that that they set that are like soft quotas basically, then whenever that diverges from actual usage, we can just tell them at least in one direction. Um, Okay. Well, we can we can move on. I just wanted to raise it and get people thinking about it um, in the background because I think this is one of the I think this is one of the things that we need to adjust over the next couple of releases to make this a thing that people don't have to worry about. Um, all right. So the next. The next thing on the agenda is RGW rate limiting from Roland. Are you here? Hey, I'm here. Uh, am I audible? 
Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, um, oh, some background. Um, I, I work for Flipkart here in India. Uh, we have deployed Ceph as a um, as a as a RGW or rather as a object S three object storage cluster. We we use it for a couple of uh, business workflows. We have a CDN front end uh, to serve a bunch of uh, images uh, that are stored as objects in a cluster. Uh, so th that that's one of our primary use cases. Uh, we also use it to store uh let's say customer invoices when when we uh deliver our e-commerce shipments uh, we, we have about a, a a petabyte of uh data right now uh the object count is approaching a billion um, we've been we've been having we've been running this in production for about two years right now uh close to two years um over the years uh what we, we we've been running hammer by the way uh, we are still on hammer um what what we have noticed over the years is that uh, our users were not very uh, familiar with how to really use object storage in an optimal manner uh, they have been mostly using the aws s3k uh, s3 sdk um and and friends um, and and we noticed a couple of uh, usage anti patterns uh, i have i have listed a bunch of these on the on the pad uh, the the end result of these was uh, that we would often see brownouts uh, and outages in our service primarily due to we would, uh, due to the cluster running out of iops altogether uh, uh, the we we sort of figured out that okay we we, we need to uh, add a bunch of um, throttles on a per account basis so that we have some sort of uh, multi tenancy uh, we are we have some sort of QoS that we can guarantee, or rather, we we put an upper limit on the on the amount of I/O that a particular account account could uh, um, hit the cluster with. Uh, so our, our initial thoughts uh, were mostly to uh, put put limits around uh, the the amount of data the data people could write uh, in terms of puts um, on the cluster because we we sort of found that okay. Uh, writing data or deleting data from the cluster was quite heavy compared to let's say just uh, fetching the objects to get calls uh, so to this end we ended up adding adding multiple throttles around uh, uh, all all http rest uh, option uh, uh, operations uh, we we uh, the way we have defined this right now is we when we onboard a user let's say when we create a user account we we give them a we 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 give we give them an upper bound on the amount of operations per unit time that can be performed. Let's say we tell them, okay, maybe you can do uh, 30 gets per second, and maybe 10 object puts per second, uh, and and uh, we count the we we count the ops on the RGW uh, process request path, and whenever whenever the the account crosses that limit, we uh, respond immediately respond with a 503 slowdown. Uh, this error code we just sort of lifted from uh, what AWS uh, S3 does today, uh, primarily so that uh, the the clients that users uh, are are currently using don't really need any don't really need any changes to handle let's say a four XX or other four twenty nine too many requests code that would be more appropriate. Uh, other than uh, so basically this this is something that we have found to be extremely useful uh, our, our current implementation um, has has a bunch of limitations for example we although although we say that okay we have let's say 10 rgws uh, an area of 10 rgws uh, so if if uh, if we give a user let's say 30 uh, a limit of 30 gets per second we end up sort of dividing it across our rgws and we uh, we have a load balancer in front uh, that that does a pretty decent job of uh, uh, distributing the requests. So we we are sort of relying upon that uh, not to really uh, target a disproportionate amount of requests to a single RGW for now. So it's been working okay. Uh, we would probably extend this to uh, put a global limit 
or rather a global counter, uh, we have not really uh, designed that or thought about that completely. Uh, also, an alternate implementation that we could we were looking at is to have a, some sort of a leaky bucket counter rather than just being a uh, upper limit uh, that gets reset at the end of each time period. What what uh, what time period did you guys use? So we 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 let users specify that. For example, uh, when we onboard a user, the one uh, we, we we discuss their their use case with them, and if if we see that okay, some guys want let's say 10 puts per second okay we we have a we have a timer that runs every second and resets the counters some some other accounts are okay with a, let's say a timer that gets reset every minute uh, i agree it's not it's not really a a, a, a great way to do that uh, that's why a leaky bucket might make more sense mm -hmm. uh, because for example you could you could burn all your quota in the in the first couple of seconds itself and then probably idle just waiting for the the limit to be reset at the end of the minute whereas with the leaky bucket you could probably uh, slowly get some some more capacity or other some more requests uh, back into your quota yeah that that seems like it's probably a pretty easy piece to change though how much how much yeah, code did it yeah. end up being it, it's quite minimal right now uh, it's it's changes the, the changes are pretty much restricted to the uh, RGW process function, as in we we, we invoked uh, 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 the the function to actually check the current count against the limit, and, and then we have a, another bunch of functions that that read the limits from uh, uh, config file for now. Uh, ideally, we would like to uh, define the limits through the Redos gateway admin command, like like we define uh, object quotas. Uh, we we did this in a bit of a hurry, so. Uh, we decided to just dump all the limits into a config file and then parse it whenever the RGW starts up. So, so we expect if, if we were to if we were to take this to completion, yeah, we would we would change the RGW uh, the Redos gateway admin command to specify and modify the limits. That's more there, often, uh, right? Because there's there's some bucket there's possible bucket policy integrations and so on. But as yeah. a whole, there's lots of there's actually lots of lots of folks that are interested in this general area. Um, upstream and, and 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 in our downstream experiences. So this is valuable input. I think one one thing I want to say is that there's there's work going on targeting post luminous, aimed at build, bringing more intrinsic fair scheduling into 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 into, into the work cycle, and, you know, and, and creating creating a scheduling step of, and as part as part as part of the, I mean we see as part of, as part of, as part of refactoring to 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 remove thread per connection. Um, to integrate into a single into, into a unified set of uh, more asynchronous processing and have, a, have scheduling steps that, available. So this would fit, fit natural as have a natural place, I think. There is there a S3 API that lets you set these rate limits on S3 for users or buckets? Uh, I, I'm not really aware of uh, any such API. If there is one. Uh, Okay. So uh, I, I can probably check that up anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think you could check Swift too. If there's an existing API that for either of those that we can mirror, that would be ideal um, before we invent a different one. Um, but in the absence yeah, of those, so like, we yeah, have... absolutely, we can just make whatever we want. But... Sure, sure. sure. Uh, so you mean, to specif you, you mean to configure the limits itself, right? An API to configure yeah. the limits? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I we, did we a thought, Google uh, and I... Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Could you repeat that? I did uh, a quick Google. That, I, I I googled it, and the thing that pops up is about like if you exceed three hundred or eight hundred requests, then you will be throttled. <laughs> but I think that's S three yeah. <laughs> their policy. I don't see one on um yeah. sort of per bucket type policies. Uh, so um, uh, to 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 the other point, I, I didn't quite catch uh, the name of the person who spoke before you, Sage. Uh, but we could probably Matt. sing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I could I could uh, send drop a note to Matt on the self devil list to discuss this further. Yeah, and as well, um, it would be fun to to bring it to the 
to the RGW standups. I mean, if you have an interest in, in joining our, you know, the upstream one or you know, occasional upstreams, we have we have a lot of we have we have, we have actually actually daily, but you know, but but we have we have constant upstream sort of communication where you can discuss things. Um, yeah, it's, it feels to me like if 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 if, if, if S3 did in, in, in you know, or AWS did engage uh, cope with APIs, they end, they end up being of two forms. They end up being what we, if you for this, it would end up being bucket or user policy if if it, if it was intended to be pro, pro, programmatically updated, or at least I would expect so. But but there also are an increasing number of, of, of I guess you would call them APIs that are just in the control panel, and it's not really specific. You know, it's not obvious how they're how and where they're materialized. <clears throat> so so we've expected that, that, that you know that, that for things for new things that, are, that where we go where we go out, we try we try to come up with if at all possible policy based extension grammar extension that that, that allows us to be in line with as much as possible with the way things are done in AWS, even if we're moving a little bit outside of what it does. And this this maybe um, goes without saying, but if you post a pull request with the, the current code that you're using, um, that'll definitely generate some some commentary. commentary. We can look at what, what you've done, <laughs> what we'd want to change before merging it upstream, whether we want to drop in a leaky bucket or not or whatever. Sure, uh, we can do that pretty much right away. That would be great. Yep, this is great. I mean, this is definitely something that um, I've heard from other um, service providers that they hit similar issues. Um, I think the last time it came up was um, uh, Rob and a DreamHost talking about what they're doing. Um, they're using HA proxy in front of Redis Gateway and they use it to do um, Whenever they identify like a, a single bucket that's getting hammered or something like that, they use it to do install exceptions that direct them to a specific gateway so that it doesn't affect other workloads or um, maybe do some other things like I don't know, I don't know all what what all they're doing, but um, yeah, this is definitely a problem that service providers hit. All right, anything else on this topic? Uh, to move on, I guess the next one's you also, it's um, fast fail requests in case of OSD slowness or high latency. Yes, uh, uh, this, this would probably also again align with what Matt spoke about uh, in terms of policies. Uh, the, the problem uh, we have noticed is again uh, due to uh, some due to uh, uh, usage anti pattern. We, we've seen people creating pretty fat. I would I won't say fat. They have been extremely large buckets. Uh, we've seen uh, buckets with uh, uh, objects uh, running upwards of let's say 100 million. Uh, we, we, this this causes a problem whenever we we uh, have hardware failures that result in uh, rebalancing at the index. Um, so uh, uh, subsequent write calls end up uh, getting queued over there, and that sort of causes back pressure at the RJWs again. Uh, and even simple, plain simple uh, read read uh, calls end up failing or timing out. Uh, the the proposal uh, the, the the solution that we've been sort of looking at is uh, have a have a uh, extend, I mean, build build on probably top of the uh, the current op timeout that we have in the RGW to uh, proactively fail requests that are uh, that are being targeted towards latent OSDs or uh, or slow OSDs. Uh, uh, the the hope being that uh, we are able to free up resources at the RGW faster uh, than rather than wait for extended timeouts. Uh, so it's so uh, the way I had described this in a in a, in a post to Seth Devil was that we wanted to implement something that looked like a, a circuit breaker, uh, so that okay if if a OSD does go latent, uh, then we would uh, stop targeting IOs to that OSD and fail fail RGW requests much earlier, uh, and maybe once it, once the once the circuit breaker timer expires, then we would probably check its health again and to see whether it was able to survive normally. Uh, so uh, 
so, so this looks like pretty much like the circuit breaker design uh, design pattern. Uh, this uh, we we try to implement this uh, on on Jewel, uh, and we also wanted to backport that this to Hammer. Uh, the the code that uh, we have right now is not really in uh, a shape that can be uh, uh, really deployed. It's it's still being tested. Uh, uh, but but the basic idea is as I have uh, described it in the in the uh, post to self devil. So I, uh, I, have a... I agree that. I agree. Go ahead. So a, a couple of comments um, on this. So the the first thing is that the um, the ill effects of having very large bucket indexes is, is a well known problem um, and one that's sort of finally been addressed in Luminous in an easy way. Um, we've had the reshard capability in Jewel for a while, so when you get a large bucket, you can reshard it across many smaller indexes um, mm -hmm. offline. But in Jewel, there is now the ability to have RGW automatically do that. Um, and so with that enabled, you should be able to avoid the situation where large buckets result in these big index objects that then have ill effects when you do a rebalance or an OSD failure or any recovery kicks in. Um, so that's the first thing. So um, I guess the, the best case scenario is that once you make that transition and these large indexes go away, then the, this problem is no longer a problem and we don't have to do anything. Um, that said, um, there are probably still going to be situations in the future where there is a problem with um, one or a small number of OSDs, um, and it would be nice to have that not eventually make too many requests pile up on that one OSD and then um, DOS the, the RGW as well. Um, but when that happens, it's not necessarily an OSD. It's usually a placement group that's actually problematic and not the whole OSD. Well, I guess it can be both. Um, so it's a little bit a little bit tricky. There is a new um, RADOS backoff mechanism in the, in the PG case. So when PG is blocked, based, like peering doesn't complete or something like that, um, there is feedback in the protocol to the client in Libratus um, so that it knows not to send requests. It might be possible to take that information and surface it up to Rados Gateway in a way so that it can see that this request is going to be blocked for the foreseeable future and behave accordingly. Um, that might be a bit more graceful than trying to sort of reverse engineer what Rados you think Rados is going to do as far as what OSDs it's going to target or something. Um, that might be a, a cleaner way to approach it. Yeah, I, I think I think that would be great. Uh, is, does that code exist in master or in any one of the releases right now? Yeah, so in, in Luminous, um, this code went in a little bit before, I guess it probably went in like February or something, um, the back off code. So the Liberatus client, okay. um, it's not exposed through the Liberatus API, it's internal to the object or code inside of Liberatus, um, but it knows which PGs not to send requests to because they're blocked effectively. Okay. Sure. I, I think I think we would be interested in looking at that. Uh, okay. Any 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 specific any specific folks that I should ping to uh, find out more about this? Probably probably me. <laughs> you can you can reach out on okay. Sentinel. But I would I would um, I would probably focus your initial efforts on moving um, validating and then moving to Luminous and resharding those large index objects because that's going to make a whole group of problems go away, not just this one problem. Um, and once you have that resolved, it might be that this is less less of a pressing issue and there are other things that are sort of more higher value things to spend your your time on. Yeah. Yeah. We 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 have an upgrade plan in place right now. We we are sort of uh, on on the upgrade plan on the upgrade part to jewel first. Uh, okay. So uh, we'll probably experiment or try out the uh, uh, manual resharding option, or uh, rather uh, the command that's available in Jewel. Uh, we we have not yet tested that to see how how that would be. Okay, yeah, that would be that probably be the immediate workaround. <laughs> that'll that'll yeah. help. Yep. Are there other other comments you have on this, Matt? Rishi's you see. Well, he, he, I think they might be interested in, in, in Adam Emerson's ASIO uh, Liberatus API stuff. This could have an impact. The, the Rados backup just, just, I was just talking, yeah, talking back channel. I, I mean, we've been talking about exposing more throttle information. So this sounds related. 
as part of the way that we've got to get to get a, a unified event loop for the top half and bottom, or the radius bottom half of, of RGW. One, 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 one thing we're happening, we're doing is Adam Emerson is working on a prototype of, of, a, of an ASIO <coughs> Liberados interface that can hook into the event, the, the, the ASIO and, um, front end that's been developed, <coughs> HTTP front end. <coughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, that. <laughs> I think that's going to be pretty. I think the RF is going to be great. I will post in the chat what it is. Yeah. Okay. That the the thing to keep in mind with the back off is that it's um, it's a it's only used in certain situations by the OSD. Um, so right by default, the OSD only does back off when like peering is stuck. Um, it also has an option to to trigger back off whenever an object is undergoing recovery, but it mostly does that just so that we get like very heavy exercise <laughs> use of that code during QA. I don't think in a real situation you'd ever actually want to do that. Um, unless maybe your objects are, you know, have a hundred million OMAP records or something, um, but in a normal cluster. Um, but it's possible we could have other thresholds that trigger that, that mechanism too. Um, okay. So is the bottom line that this is mostly like a Rado situ issue? Like if, say, you had a bad disk that's slowing down an OSD, that should I, be handled there mostly. I think so. Yeah, I think so. The, so the, the specific root cause in this case is the large RGW objects, and that's just RGW needs to get fixed. Um, but in general, it's possible that something goes wrong with Rados and you end up with like so, the, the scenario you could think of was, you know, one PG gets is stuck peering for some reason. There's a broken something. I don't know. Something happened in Rados. So you lost too many or something. And RGW will happily keep going, um, but every you know 100th request will happen to touch that PG and block indefinitely. And eventually, those will pile up and consume all of your threads in your work queue. And so, that eventually, Rados scale will get starved, even though it's only one percent of the data that's unavailable. Um, and so having a way to detect that situation and mitigate it is is still a good thing, I guess. So I would I would think about the Rados gateway problem as not as a generic issue where a, some, a subset of the PGs are unavailable or blocking or something and being able to respond to that situation um, and deal with the OMAP index thing totally separately. Yes, uh, agree. Uh, we, uh, we we generically targeted this as a fencing mechanism for, as you said, uh, misbehaving PGs or misbehaving uh, OSDs. Uh, the the yeah. immediate use case for us was at the at the index pool. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so if you follow up on stuff develop, I can I can point you with the backup stuff. Um, sure, sure. I, I'll I'll drop a note. Okay. Um all right, I think the next subject is uh is Rados level intercluster replication. Let's see is uh Joyhan is here. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, be before I start talking, I, I just want to say that uh, my, my English is not very, very good. So please forgive me if I can exp express myself very efficiently. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I'll start, yep, no start now. Uh, uh, during the past year, we experienced some kind of uh, Fatal disaster, uh, like uh, man-made misoperations and uh, network problems. So we we think that uh, we need a, a real-time cross-cluster or application mechanism uh, that, that we can uh, when 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 one cluster goes down and we can quickly change to another one to make uh, the upper-level system run smoothly. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so, so uh, we, we now we are using RBD, R, RBD, and uh, we are planning to uh, set that as well. 
uh, in the near future. And uh, some of our, uh, not, not only our RBD clients uh, need, need this replication mechanism, uh, CFS, CFFS um, clients also demand uh, inter, inter IDC uh, data, data replication. Uh, so uh, we, we think uh, maybe we can uh, implement uh, some kind of uh, Redis level replication and uh, ju just uh, do this one, uh, I don't know, uh, once and for all. And we, we don't need uh, the upper level systems to, to, do the, to do the job separately. And uh, so uh, uh, at, at, at our first glance, uh, we, we thought that this uh, uh, this maybe maybe uh, maybe a, a little difficult because uh, uh, we we can we can just uh, replicate uh, the rep, repo piece to another cluster, uh, but during the USD failure, if 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 that's if that's if, if that's present and. Uh, uh, how how do we make sure that this replication goes uh, uh, still works right? And as and another problem is uh, like RBD, uh, some RBD operations may cross multiple objects. Uh, so how how do we ensure this uh, this this consistency? Uh, for example, uh, uh, one operation across uh, involves the object A and object B, and we know that Redis can uh, make sure can make sure uh, operate uh, operations from the same client uh, targeting the same object are uh, are, are done in the sequence they they arrived. But when they come from different clients or uh, they are targeting different objects, uh, this this the sequence is not guaranteed. Uh, so how how do we how do we uh, how do we maintain this consistency for uh, cross-object operations? I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's 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 clear. So this is a so we've we've talked about about this um, general problem a couple different times in the past, um, and specifically the the consistency issue um, always comes up as as the challenge because you have PGs that are shared uh, across hundreds of servers, and you want want them to be ordered we've we've traditionally approached it in a in a different way um or at least the existing proposal that's out there so your proposal is to look at um is to create object uh, sets where the client specifically communicates which is that right uh uh our approach is like this uh for the first for the first pro for the first question uh we we think that we can uh we can make the make make the replication goes right uh, w w with the presence of OSD failure. Uh, if we can uh, if we can make sure uh, the journal, the OSD journal, is only uh, is only deleted or removed or uh, overwritten when their corresponding repo piece is replicated to another another cluster and. Uh, uh, during during uh, during the recovery uh, the recovery phase, uh, when be, before a rec recovery source start pushing the object, the missing object start before before it before it start pushing the the missing the miss object, it makes sure that all repo piece uh, related to this uh, to this missing object is replicated first are replicated first. And then it it, it it start pushing 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 it pushing this object. If this is possible, if this is make if this is make 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 made sure, then we think the the, the first first problem the first problem is, is can be resolved. Uh, I, I don't know if if we are we are going the right way. I think I think that in a, in a at a high level that makes sense. Um, so as long as you only replicate something to the secondary cluster after you're sure that the first cluster has it fully durable, that makes that definitely yeah, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not. Okay. I would be. I would be careful. Um, 
assuming that it's the same journal that the, that the file store currently implements, um, because that, that changes when you start looking at different OST backends. Um, but if you think at a high level that there is some sort of data journal associated with each place and group, that is the, the sequence of transactions that are being applied. And as long as you preserve that and those journal records until they get replicated, then I think that that will okay. that covers it. Yeah. Okay, we we will uh, we'll notice that. Uh, okay. For the for the second question, uh, we we think that we uh well, we can we can introduce some some concept like object set uh, corresponding to the upper level systems concepts like uh, RBD Im image. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, for 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 example, uh, for one RBD image, we can uh, we can correspond it with an with an object set, and an RBD op operation is an uh, corresponds to an uh, object set operation, and uh, if we can if we can make sure, uh, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I don't know. I'm making myself. Uh, uh, we think that uh, if we can make sure uh, one ob object set operation uh, get replicated only only when uh, all uh, object object set operations before before it are replicated uh, are are sent are sent uh, are sent to the to the Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, I, I start talking again. I start talking this 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 question again. Uh, so at first we we think that uh, uh, we should uh, forward uh, object op repo piece uh, within the same uh, object set operation to the same intermediate node, and then an intermediate node. Uh, Send the send these repo piece to to the to the other cluster only when uh, only on two conditions. The first is all uh, all object copy object set operations that before this before this one are replicated to the other cluster, and the second is all all repo piece within the same object set operation are right at at the at the uh, intermediate node, and uh, when these two conditions are true, and we can start uh, the intermediate node start start uh, send these repo piece to the backup to the backup uh, to the backup cluster, and we think if this is if this is making sure if this is made sure, then uh, the second question is also resolved. <laughs> Uh, yeah. no, I, think, I, think, I think that makes sense. If I'm under, if I'm understanding right, what you're that essentially is describing um, transactions, where you would have the Rados clients would say this group of operations need to all be done together before they get replicated, or some yeah 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 some sort of yeah. transaction concept. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's going down that path to have some sort of transaction. <clears throat> that's one. That's one direction we can go. The thing that worries me about that is well, a couple of things. One, all the current Rados clients don't operate in terms of transactions. Um, so they would have to be rewritten um, or modified to do that. Um, the second thing though, is that the it's not just, it's not really atomicity that usually matters, it's ordering. So there'll be some, some application that's using say, let's say it's Oracle and it has two, two RBD block devices um, and it will, write something to the journal block device. And once that's commits, then it'll make some update to its other block device. And it's the ordering that matters. The, the journal change has to be sent to the remote cluster before the other one. They don't have to be sent together. It just has to be, they just have to be applied in the correct order. Yeah, um, yeah. And I don't know that this mechanism would, would capture that. Um, I mean, it, it, it might be able to be modified so that it would, but, um, I want to take a minute to, when we've talked about this in the past, we've had a, a different um, approach to this because um, we've, we've, we've spent a fair bit of time thinking about how, how this could work. Um, and uh, I wish, I don't know if this, we ever wrote this up somewhere, um, but the basic idea was to have a, 
um, um, a series of checkpoints um, in time that are essentially consistency points across the source cluster. And I have, say you had a checkpoint every you know, 10 seconds or something for, for the sake of argument. And then the remote cluster, and at that, at, at that particular point in time, everything in the, um, in the source cluster was, it, it, was a, it was a point in time checkpoint. You can think of it sort of like a snapshot, although it isn't actually that. Um, and then you would replicate to the remote cluster based on that point in time. And as when you reach the next checkpoint on the source cluster, then you could replicate copy all the changes up until that second checkpoint over. Um, the, the problem with that is that in order to actually do a checkpoint, you, have to, you actually have to pause all clients <laughs> in order to have them stop doing I.O. So you quiesce the, the cluster. Um, and in practice, that's too slow. And so what we, we had a project um, about two years ago, three years ago, with a group of um, students that tried to figure out if there was a way to efficiently basically um, have um, a checkpoint on a cluster without actually pausing IO or having a very minimal pause to IO um, based on measuring the bounds on clock drift with NTP. Um, and the, what they found was that you can have a pretty modest um, delay um, to get this checkpoint across the cluster. Um, like sub millisecond in, on with sort of like typical networking hardware. Um, so that every, you could imagine that every 10 seconds you would have a sub millisecond spike in latency essentially. Um, but the cluster would know that all the IOs were essentially ordered where everything that happened before that was before and everything what, that was after was after. And then you could replicate to the remote cluster based on those checkpoints. I don't know, I, do you know if this was ever written up somewhere in sort of a human, Consumable. Is there a design uh, doc? Uh, do you mean this this link? Uh, I do you mean this link? Uh, uh, okay. Can I chime in a bit? Yes. Yeah. yeah. This is Joel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, sorry. I'll... Okay. So Ricardo and I had um, a conversation with Sage not too long ago. Well, it feels like ages now. But, um, we have a pad um, in, on on the other pad describing a, a, a sort of similar approach to some extent, in which we have a, a daemon that will basically act as a proxy and as a sort of a sequencer for the operations. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry for the, the background noise. Um, so the, the whole thing um, that we eventually bumped against was the, the causal ordering of operations, right? So this is the, the hardest part of the, the whole problem is ensuring that we ensure the, well, the correct ordering. Um, Picard is on vacation now, and he would likely be the the best person to to argue the the case. But one of the things we considered was having probably a, a maybe a quorum of these demons that will take the the operations from the OSDs. Basically, the OSDs would push the operations into these sequencers, and maybe have a a sort of a snapshot that would be basically decided by these these um, proxies. Basically, they would agree at the time in which they would issue a, a stop the world instruction. And basically, all the OSDs would um, receive the instruction that to, they should increase a, the epoch, epoch or something. Um, and so this was the, the very rough idea. Um, we didn't really have the chance to to look into the the things that Sage shared at the time, um, and this is one of the, th the the reasons why I suggested on on the mailing list that we should probably well, it would be nice to have this discussion later in September when all the vacation season is over. 
and we come back and we can actually dedicate our time to this. So, okay. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, I, I said my, my English is not very good. My, my listening is even worse than my oral English. So, uh, so, 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 so sorry for this. Uh, maybe we can, we, can, we can talk about this using emails. Uh, do, you, do you think that's feasible? Uh, I don't know. I'm very, really yeah. sorry for this. No, yeah, no, no problem. I think it's, it's a it's a complicated topic. It's hard to it's hard to cover also in a, in a short period of time. Um, I can, we can just share a couple of links. Um, I, I pasted one into the chat. That's the output of the um, or at least the code from the the clinic project. This is a a summer pro or no a year long project that some undergrad students did, looking at the time synchronization problem. Um, so I think you can broadly you can sort of divide this whole whole piece into sort of two parts. One is um, what are the mechanics of how we move the data from point A to point B? And I think that there are lots of ways to do that. And um, that's sort of your point one um, that you originally raised. And the second part of it is how do you get these consistency points so that you have a consistent point in time replica um, at the destination? And that's what this project was about. It was about how you, how you, um, you can look at the clock synchronization to have the shortest possible stop the world event in order to get this consistent point in time to get the ordering that you need. Um, and I think regardless of what we do for the first part, that second piece with the, the time synchronization can be applied. Um, and the better, if you have better clocks and you have you know, atomic clocks or something like Google does, then great. It's like, you know, basically zero time to do that. And if you have really bad clocks, then you have a longer stop the world. But um, the idea is that it'll sort of work in any any environment. Um, okay. There was a there was actually a written report that they delivered as well. I don't know, Greg. Do you know if that's actually posted somewhere? It's posted somewhere. I, I okay. don't know, it, but okay. I mean, it, well, if we can at some point, maybe we we can find that we can share that as well because I think that has that gives some background information too that'll be. Okay. But yeah, let's let's follow up on the email list, um, and we'll gather all the all the links because we have like three proposals now, basically, um, and try to find the. Okay. Uh, I understand. Okay. 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 Thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks so much. I think this is a this is a really exciting problem that we never really gotten around to addressing, but I think it's interesting. <laughs> a lot of us are pretty excited about this possibility so yeah so i i suggest that we talk a bit more about this in early september mm -hmm. and okay okay, um, okay because until then i will eventually be on vacation ricardo is currently on vacation it will be part two i'll look into the the whole thing yeah. but i also am quite excited about the prospect of working on this so yeah um yeah cool cool okay. all right um okay thanks uh let's see the next item here is um Juan and Tushar Yuan and Tushar are you guys here hey so uh let me try to share my screen here sure let's see Tushar let's see Yuan I see it. Okay, so uh, here's some uh, updates for the uh, shared read and link hash for IBD and IGW. So let, let me try to give you some uh, background. So initially, we are working on the uh, write back uh, SSD cache for IBD, and in June, CDM, uh, Jason and Sage suggests. Uh, Right back is too difficult to handle those uh, consistency. So we, we, we might look at the uh, read-only cache first, which should be much easier. So we we uh, switched go to the uh, read-only cache. And uh, the, the design goal is, uh, which would be a standalone SSD caching library. 
that can be reused between RBD and RGW. Um, currently, uh, we are focusing on two uh, use cases here. The first one is uh, libRBD shared readily cache. Uh, basically, uh, if you have a, a parent image, and you have a lots of clone image. Those clone image can read from parent image cache before uh, copy on write happen. And currently, we have some um, code uh, that generally work, uh, but still, I'm I'm trying to uh, make those uh, unit tests passing. The second case is uh, Redis gateway in mutable caching, um, which uh, there's an existing pull request from uh, Mania, and uh, but this this uh, pull request is against uh, Jewel. And uh, it also needs uh, needs to uh, do a clean up. Okay, so this is the uh, current status. Let me try to uh, uh, give you some um, details for the uh, design. So this is the uh, general architecture. Uh, basically, there will be three parts uh, in our in the uh, in our current design. The first one is. Uh, there will be a libcache file, which is a common library that does uh, read write on SSD. Uh, for now, we are using a sparse file based cache. So um, there will be um, just like something like a file store design. There will be many small four mega objects uh, on, on those uh, SSDs. And second part is the uh, policy. Uh, which is uh, which will try to control the cache promotion, demotion, and also the uh, sizing of the cache. For now, we, we are using a simple ARIO based. So there will be an ARIO list uh, in, in, in a policy. And the last part is uh, actually the hooks. Uh, there will be a light embedded hooks inside uh, LibRBD. And also inside the Lib Redis Gateway, which will call uh, API from Lib Cache file, so that uh, we can do the uh, SSD caching in, inside uh, in RBD and in RGW. Okay, uh, here's some uh, details for the uh, RBD uh, readily SSD caching. Um, Before that, uh, this is the uh, clone flow for RBD. So usually we have a template image, say uh, RBD zero, and then we create a protected snapshot on that image. And uh, and then we, we cloned many uh, images based on that snapshot. Um, there's a detail uh, here that we should promote uh, contents from the uh, snapshot. Uh, which is uh, protected. Okay, so this is the uh, overview for for the uh, uh, shared uh, readme cache for RBD. Uh, basically, um, on each compute node, there will be a shared uh, cache file, uh, which is uh, which is actually the contents uh, of the Protected snapshot, and uh, for for each clone image, uh, if if the uh, if there's no uh, copy on write happen, uh, all reads will be where all reads actually can go from uh, serviced from those uh, shared cache file. Uh, for example, you have a uh, uh, several VMs uh, on 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 one compute node, and but uh, most of the uh, contents of the image uh, should be the same. So we can actually service those uh, read requests from a single uh, shared, shared cache. Um, only a small crushing of the uh, image will be uh, modified. Um, and for, for those modified contents, we actually have a, a local cache for, for, for that part. So this is the uh, overview for, for, for the shared read and cache. Um, 
yeah, this is the uh, uh, cache metadata design. And uh, currently, we are actually using a uh, UIN64 uh, for eight bytes for 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 metadata. There will be two bits indicates uh, whether the, this block is in in the uh, shared limit cache or or in in its own cache. And, and also, there will be uh, 62 bits, uh, which were uh, indicates the block ID. I, I I must have missed something in the first couple of slides. What's the difference between um, the local cache and the shared cache? I was I was thinking uh, that the local cache was the in-memory cache, but you're saying that there's an on-disk cache for. Uh, each let me try well. to explain here. So, okay. um, um, so shared cache uh, actually is the uh, uh, the promoted uh, shared cache and local cache are both uh, cache on SSD. It's mm -hmm. not a in-memory cache. So okay. shared cache is for the uh, protected snapshot. Mm -hmm. Usually there will be uh, so say if you have a, a several uh, virtual machines on a computer node. Uh, usually their uh, system OS operating system disks are the same. So uh, lots of, of their contents should be the same. Actually, you can serve those uh, from the uh, shared cache file. But if there's a, a copy on write happen, for example, if I modified uh, the uh, IP address uh, of one uh, virtual machine. That part may be should should be uh, cache copy. Okay. I want to happen on that part. So that's the read write cache on a per image basis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, okay. let me try to try to uh, introduce this page. So okay. this is the uh, uh, read flow. Uh, basically. Uh, for for each uh, read, there will be a cache lookup first. Uh, if it's in the uh, uh, shared uh, shared cache, that means uh, we can we actually don't do write on that block. So it's still safe to read from the uh, protected snapshot. And uh, for the uh, an another case is uh, in the two prime case. Uh, it's actually uh, it's already been uh, written before, so we have to take care of this block. Um, we have to record this uh, in, in its own meta table, and then for the next read, we are, we need to promote the uh, uh, real contents from the Redis tier. Okay. Okay. So. Um, quite similar, this is the uh, right pass. Um, the first step is uh, we will still do a cache lookup first. And if it's if it's in the uh, shared cache, um, we have to mark those uh, entries. We have to remove remove those entries from uh, from a uh, shared cache uh, on the next read. We will need to promote the real contents from the uh, Redos tier. If it's in the uh, copy and write cache, I mean, I mean local cache here, we have to invalidate those uh, chunk in the cache file, and then, because uh, we are we are randomly caching. I'm not sure if I make this uh, clear, Sage. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. Um, it's not it's not quite the way that I had imagined it in my head, but I haven't I think I haven't thought about this in a while. So you can why don't you continue and then we can come back to it. Me too. Okay. So um, currently we we are trying to do. Uh, uh, the the country there's an uh, optimization point here. Uh, um, for now, we we will just promote the uh, uh, shared cache 
on when when we open the first clone image. Um, so this kind of this is kind of uh, very slow for for the first open. And this could be uh, in, improved actually. Okay, so uh, here's some uh, initial results. Uh, this is tested on our smart node with two OSD. And uh, for, the, for the baseline, uh, it is tested without uh, SSD cache. Um, so it's, uh, it's, oh, by the way, this is a SSD cluster. So the LPS, LPS is not, not that bad. And with, uh, for the second row, we we use we use uh, a readme caching here, and uh, we can see the RPS uh, increased a lot, and also the tail latency, average latency, uh, re reduced a lot. We also tried um, to test the uh, shared shared readme caching, and uh, from the results, it it looks like uh, uh, we are hitting the uh, SSD bottleneck here. So it's uh, with two volumes and uh, the the LPS increased like uh, 70k. So it's kind of uh, the spec performance of the uh, SSD. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, currently, uh, I'm, I'm still fighting with uh, some unit tests and. I think I can fix that and send out a PR soon. Okay. For the baseline results here, what was the um, uh, what was the the configuration for for the OSDs and was RBD cache enabled? Uh, no, we disable RBD cache here. It's just a okay. uh, very small cluster with two OSDs. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. File store? Yeah, file store based. Okay. And uh, next part is the uh, Redis gateway, uh, readme caching. Um, so uh, I, I actually got this uh, information from uh, the MOC project. Um, um, so they're 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 kind of building a, actually they're building a CDN cluster behind those uh, Redis gateway clusters. Um, the 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 reason is uh, they they don't use a public CDN cluster because they they have some uh, authentication requests over the uh, Redis gateway users. So you have to uh, you have to place the CDN cluster behind those uh, Redis gateway clusters. That, that's the uh, very special requirements. Uh, basically, um, let, let me go to this page. So basically, there will be a um, two-level cache for 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 those Redis gateway cluster. Level one cache means a local cache for for each Redis gateway instance. Uh, for example, Redis gateway one has its own local cache. And Redis Gateway 2 has its, has also got its own local cache. Um, the L2, L2 cache here means uh, Redis Gateway 1 can actually read from the uh, other uh, Redis Gateway instance cache. For example, Redis Gateway 1 can read uh, the cache from the Redis Gateway 2. Uh, this is kind of a level 2 cache. And uh, I Uh, so the country they have a, a workable PR for uh, one three one four four, and um, I actually checked a, a bit on their code. So currently there there might be some some uh, cleanup work needed because the uh, the logic is uh, is tightly uh, embedded in Redis. Redos cache, uh, RGW cache, and um, it might need to be uh, decoped. 
to to uh, co uh, decoupled to uh, cope with our design to use the uh, uh, lib cache file and also the policy uh, file. But uh, I think that that should be uh, easy work. Mm -hmm. Do you mind flipping back to, I think it's slide eight. Yeah, so it looks like this, this approach is sort of looking forward a little bit to the point where you'll both have a write back cache for that's local to a specific image, and you'll have the shared cache for the the cloned parents. Um, that might make sense. I don't I haven't thought about this too deeply, but the way that I was originally hoping this could be done would was that um, this would effectively be two different caches. So you would have a a shared image cache. You'd have a shared cache that's on the on the on the parent image, um, and so you'd have multiple processes in memory that have their own sort of that have that cache open, um, and they would be sharing their state on disk, or in some like very minimal way with some coordinating process, um, so that they could they could make use of that shared cache. And because the data would, was immutable in that cache, it would be a relatively simple coordination problem. Like you could just have oh. files on disk that are named after the object, um, but that that but that shared cache would be a sort of a standalone thing that's just for the immutable image, um, and whatever code wrapped that up would be able to be reused in Rados Gateway, and then there would be a separate cache that would probably work very differently for the write back, um, or whatever we usually eventually do for the the per image, um, cow data cache file. That used to have there with the two prime. Um, so, for example, you wouldn't have those two state bits. You wouldn't have a single lookup table that would talk about state in both caches. Um, but instead, okay. the read path would just say, um, "This block doesn't exist in the child image. Um, I'm going to fall back to reading from the parent image. The parent image has a cache on it. Let me go look it up in the cache and see if it's there. Um, and if that misses, if I end up, if I do a read." Um, if I end up reading that block or object from Rados, when I read it in, I would asynchronously also put it into the cache because I know that it's immutable and I don't have to worry about races and so on. Um, uh, so that I was think the uh, key, key point is uh, um, currently we uh, in, in the uh, in the current imp implementation, this is actually a library. Okay. So, uh, do you mean we should switch to some uh, socket based read or I I I don't want to um, we should probably look at what you've written first because <laughs> I'm, I'm there are like a million different like implementation details that like come in as soon as you actually start trying to write this this is just sort of what we were thinking um, I think what we talked about um, okay okay at some point in the past so let's let's look at the implementation and see and see what you have right now. Um, Okay. I think I think at one point we had sort of dreamt up a way where um, we would use um, I can't remember what it was. I think we would use a socket so that somebody has to manage the LRU to retire things from the immutable cache, and so there'd be some socket co minimal coordination just to like manage the LRU and evict things. Um, but that getting and putting would be able to just read directly from like a file system on the SSD. I think was the original idea. Um, okay. But again, I think it, once you start implementing it, you're going to come up with all sorts of reasons to do things differently. So sure, sure. I don't want to. I don't want to tell you how to do this because <laughs> you're the one who's actually doing the work. Um, so let's look at the. Once you have the pull request, I mean, you might not. I wouldn't necessarily wait until you have every unit test passing or whatever to to publish it. I would just publish it, and we can we can review the design and approach okay. before. Okay. We get too far along, um, and I think I'd, I'd like um, 
Jason obviously to weigh into. He's not he's not here. I think he's out today or something. I don't know. I don't see him online. Um, he's on PTO to the other week. Okay, that that explains that. Okay, I see. So I I I'll, I think I'll send out the PR tomorrow. Perfect. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Um, the those performance numbers are great. I think it's really it's good to see that this is gonna this is gonna work. <laughs> So that's exciting. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, Sage. Yep. Thank you. Um, all right. Anything else on that topic? All right. I guess Mina, you want to talk about the array codes and Ceph? I just remembered you sent me an email like last week and I haven't replied, replied yet, so sorry about that. Um, hi, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Welcome. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to know if that review is all right uh, for array codes. So I, I'll just share uh, this pad link which we had for the array code description. And, and right now, actually, there is a one uh, pull request. Mm -hmm. This, this looks like this one. Okay, yeah, that's how I was looking at. Yep. So this is the one that adds the sub chunks and makes the internal yes. API change? Yes. Okay. I think probably the next step is just to review this. <laughs> this is adding a new a new set of functions that includes sub chunks. Is it also changing the I think the way that we would, um, we we're hoping to make this transition was um, introduce the new the new set of calls that pass the list of subjunks, and then um, re-implement the old calls in terms of the new calls. So they just pass in like a single subjunk that covers the whole thing. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So right and now we'll have only one decode function, which will uh, have. Uh, the subchunk indices as part of, along with the minimum to repair. So the minimum to repair, right. it will return uh, subchunk IDs along with the uh, OSD IDs. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there are some changes in EC util. Uh, I'm not sure, like, uh, I mean, if if there is some part like stopping from like, you know, the review or something, but. Uh, so this so we have tested it uh, even for uh, the previous cases like the normal read solomon case etc mm -hmm. so uh, so ec util also has some changes okay i think i think that's fine i'm not super familiar with this code i'll be honest um i think josh and loic are more familiar loic isn't here <laughs> um but I think, yeah, I think I think the next step is just to review this, um, and we will eventually want to rebase it so that it's a, it doesn't have the merge commits in there. Um, but we'll want to review it carefully, get it tested, and merge. And then I think the next step is then you'll be able to do your your follow-on changes, adding the new the new code on top of it. We just haven't yes. we've just been busy with the luminous release, so we haven't um, been paying much attention to these these pull requests the last few weeks. But hopefully that will change shortly. Okay, yeah, that's it. I just uh, wanted to just kind of remind uh, you yes. guys again about this. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks for thanks for coming by and reminding us. I think. Yep. So, yeah, Josh, you're here. We should just remember to look at this in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Actually, one one. Uh, 
yeah, we would like to submit it at a, a particular conference and we think that it would be nice to have this as part of CEF at that time. So yeah. that's one reason uh, we are thinking of like pushing it like, yeah. So if you, if you want to, if you want us to do any changes, I mean, maybe after your luminous release, like uh, you can like um, talk to us like, and we will be like quick to do this. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the only, so we have about a week before the release, hopefully a week before the release goes out. Um, and then Josh is going to be on vacation for two weeks and then I'm going to be on vacation for one week. Um, so it'll probably be several weeks before, before we pick this up again. Um, so there's okay. a, there'll be a bit of a delay, but absolutely. Yeah. I think we want to get this in sooner rather than later. Um, and early, early in the post luminous cycle would be the right time to do it. Okay. Thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks so much. Um, okay. I think the last, the last item is Prometheus. John and Jan. Hey, uh, Jan, are you on? Um, I should be now. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Oh, please, please start. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of review with the group where we've got to on this um, and talk about some of the, the open questions. So I created a pad. Um, the Prometheus module is in the tree courtesy of Dan. Um, and I think the next step is to bring in the code that exposes the sort of central cluster statistics in addition to the performance counters, which are currently all that it's providing. Um, so the, the the hope is that we can sort of borrow that code from the Ceph exporter um, that I believe you guys are already using. Um, Right. So I guess that part's pretty um, pretty simple and uncontroversial. Um, the I, I I think the the big unknown at the moment is whether we want to implement um, Prometheus endpoints on individual set services or whether we want to. Um, just say to people, if they want to get their stats directly from daemons, then they do it like with an agent. So they they run something like Collecti or Diamond or whatever it is on their Ceph server. Um, and so that then influences how we expose the service discovery stuff from Ceph Manager to Prometheus. Because if they're using an agent, we just need to give them, we just need to give Prometheus the list of host names. Whereas if we're talking to individual Ceph services, to get the Prometheus stats, then we need to tell Prometheus about all of the individual staff services. So I, I throw that to the room. Um, there's actually another thing uh, that uh, came to mind. I actually um, also started a pad, but <laughs> um, so even if we only expose stuff uh, from a Ceph manager, so from one manager daemon, um, we kind of have to think about uh, about yeah which actual daemon exposes these stats and um, how can we manage availability if a manager daemon goes away and I think that would again we would really um, um, you know it would be really nice to have uh, the service discovery even even on the manager level already because then we could um, just point Prometheus at this service discovery and uh, could even deal with, um, you know, different manager demons. Does that make sense? John, you're muted. Sorry, I always do that. Um, I, I haven't thought about this too much because I had kind of optimistically assumed that we could give Prometheus the addresses, usually the three addresses of where the managers are running, and that it would just succeed in talking to whichever one happened to be up. Um, but we should test that theory, because I, I guess there's no guarantee that that's actually how it works. I'm just kind of assuming it, it does what 
seems sensible to me. No, I believe it would then scrape all three manager instances and not sure how it would deal with um, the same metrics being exposed on, on different mm -hmm. endpoints. Right, but only one of them is active. So Prometheus would try and connect to three servers and it would find that only one of them was actually responding to its requests. Okay, yeah, we should test that. There's, there is definitely a timeout for the scraping. Um, not sure what, what impact that has, so if, if that times out every time on, on two scrape targets. Should, should technically work, yes. You're muted again. God, I am doing that like <laughs> all the time this week. I don't know why. Um, there's an unrelated change that I'm working on that lets the standbys um, forward requests. Um, so it lets them, if they want, if they implement HTTP, they can um, re send redirects to the to the people who are trying to connect when they connect to a standby. So that obviously doesn't help if you have a manager server that is actually offline. Um, but in the situation where you've you've got like two standbys and an active one, it means that if Prometheus tries to connect to a standby, it will get redirected to the active one, which could actually be a bad thing, as we just discussed, if it doesn't like getting duplicate metrics. So maybe actually we, we wouldn't want to enable that for Prometheus itself. Hmm. Mm. Well, hopefully Prometheus just has the behavior we want, and we can just only have the active manager responding to HTTP requests. Is the idea that the service discovery piece will, whatever, dump out like a CLI command that also configures the manager endpoints as well as whatever else we decide to tell Prometheus about? So you, you, the service discovery stuff would obviously be getting served from the manager. So something has to have told the Prometheus server how to talk to the manager to begin with. Um, but if the thing doing, if the service discovery is happening via a script on the Prometheus node that is fetching from manager and then writing out to a local file, it could be that Prometheus itself, yeah, learns about the managers from that mechanism. And the, the initial input is to that script rather than to Prometheus telling it where to do the service discovery originally. Right. Yes. It could be that you tell it what cluster to talk to and it says, okay, here are your managers and or also, these are the hosts and whatever else we decide to do. Well, you'd still be having to give it an address initially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the question I have, so the, there's another question you threw out to the room earlier about um, whether the service discovery piece would be scraping from daemon targets or whether you just give it host names and it would talk to an agent. Presumably, there's going to be an agent of some form because you also want to be collecting CPU and disk and host all that other all those other metrics. Also, I would think that would be handled outside SF. There is there is a node exporter for um, Prometheus already, or it can also there's a collect the uh, um, metric collector too. I don't know mm -hmm. if we really need to re-implement that. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we wouldn't want to re-implement it, but I wonder if um, if it's a node exporter, then it probably only knows how to export host information, right? It wouldn't know how to also fetch your daemon information for you. If it were collecty, then it's a more general pluggable thing, so you could get both CPU information and ask it for the Ceph daemon information. Right. Well, there is there is a um, um, a text exporter that's included in the node exporter. So you can basically just uh, create a, a text file in a certain directory and the node exporter will expose that too. Um, I've actually, we have a few things set up uh, for that uh, through that mechanism for um, RBD and uh, Smartmon, for example. But okay. uh, I would guess that's that's not too performant in, in the yeah. long run. Yeah, you basically run a script and pipe the output into a file and Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm not too worried about the scraping metrics directly from Ceph daemons. It seems like that's always going to be annoying because even if it's 
if it's something like collecty, you have to go configure collecty and tell it these are the demons, these are their admin socket locations, right? Uh, not really. You well, I, I don't know how the collecty thing currently works, but like the diamond plugin that we wrote doesn't need any configuration because it just go and lists the admin sockets. It, it figures oh, okay. out what it's running. Okay, so we could have a single package that you install on each host that runs a single daemon that just exposes all set metrics. Yeah, that's what okay. I'm thinking. I see, okay. Okay. So that's probably the easiest thing then. Yes. The for the service is called Reborn. A, yes, and well, indeed. Yeah, you still have all the, all the work to make the service discovery work. Yeah. Or at least like that's, that, that would be the nice part if, if Ceph Manager could ex or would know about um, um, these endpoints, then that would be easy, obviously. Um, otherwise, that uh, yeah would either be a little hacky or quite complicated, I feel like. If we assume that the configuration of the agents is uniform, then we could make it so that the Prometheus module has an option to say, well, a Boolean to say, I'm running an agent, and then like an int to say what port the agent listens on. That way, the Prometheus module would be able to take the list of Ceph server host names that it already knows and tag on the port that the user's configured and then tell Prometheus how to go talk to the agents based on that. So the user still has to configure it, but they have a single point to, to configure it when they've installed an agent. Mm -hmm. And we could conceivably have a default for that setting, right? That yeah. happens to be the same thing that our package used as its problem. I mean, I think when um, when Dan was setting the default port for Prometheus, there's some wiki where you uh, you just assign your own port, so they're all unique. So we have a Ceph port assigned. So we could just pick a second port that's the Ceph host agent port, if you happen to be running that. So it would be a zero that conf thing. You just you just install the package. It would just serve up everything in var and Ceph. I mean, yeah, and then if we and then service discovery would just have to say these are the hosts that have demons, and it would go look at the, connect to that port on those hosts. Yeah, although you would have to have if you were running something like collect D, you would have to have configured collect D to listen we on the Ceph port. You wouldn't need to. If if we wrote our own little agent that just oh. if it just serves that Prometheus style yeah. content from everything in Var and Ceph, yeah. I so I, I hadn't I hadn't been proposing writing our own little agent, but it's not a crazy idea. It just I don't know. So so I think some people get kind of a, a warmer fuzzier feeling if we're plugging into. Yeah. Something generic, but but then if you have Node Exporter, if if Node Exporter is enough for the generic stuff, then we're not throwing anything out. If we just write our own agent yeah. just as the set stuff as well, it's exactly kind of yeah. More service if we do it that way, it would be the fewest number of moving parts, the least configure. Like if you run Collecty, you have to go configure Collecty, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas if we have an agent. It's like you know, a couple hundred lines of Python. It's not that much code, presumably, and it's mm -hmm. and you just install it, yeah. and you're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it's just a boolean switch in config here or whatever that tells the um, service discovery agent whether or not to tell Prometheus to probe the Ceph agent. Or to just pull it for manager. Yeah. And then there'd probably be okay. another thing that tells that would also direct a search discovery thing to like tell Prometheus to scrape host level information from the normal host agent. Because I think in, yes. in most configurations, like you just have the default Prometheus host thing, but you'd want to just have Ceph make sure that all its hosts are being scraped, right? Yeah. Tell yeah, I, yeah. We need to go and check the 
the service discovery format and see what that looks like. I, I guess you say like host and then the node exporter port, comma, the Ceph port. Presumably you can tell it multiple ports. Let's check it. The only kind of gotcha to that is if I, I haven't checked how good the disk stats are that you get out of node exporter, we might run into people who like how good collecty is at telling you about disks and find that what comes out of node exporter is insufficient. Mm -hmm. But that's that can be overcome, of course, if they just want to install collecty and use it instead of yeah. node exporter, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I might go. I might go write that agent. I think because it's mainly going to be the same code as we had for diamond. I can just yeah, write that so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, yeah. I think I'm good. Okay, and for its worth, there is already a collect the exporter for Prometheus. So I think that's probably just a drop-in replacement for the node exporter, or could be used alongside even. Yes. Yeah. So Jan, are you up for taking the code from Ceph Exporter and putting it into the Prometheus module? Yeah, sure. Cool. That uh, would have been my next step. Awesome. Cool. Otherwise, I'd have to fix the Ceph Exporter for the new health format anyway, which I'm probably yeah. still going to do. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Cool. Cool. Good. Well, thanks, guys. Just all right. Anything else that we should discuss? Going once. Well, uh, yep. could 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 you direct me to somebody that is more in tautology? So I've run into a few snags on the free BSD port. So. I keep only running Jenkins tests, whereas now the standalone has also moved to Tautology, and I foresee that we're only going to run uh, short tests in Jenkins in, in the future. So I'll be more or less uh, required to go into Tautology to get any coverage on the, on the more invasive tests. So I need somebody that can help me figure out why setup.py isn't uh, very pleasing for me. Um, I would ask in the Sepia channel. On Sepia channel, um, there are some. Yeah, I'm on IRC only on and off. It's uh, I'm an old okay. fart. <laughs> uh, I should do IRC, but it's a long time. Yeah, I think um, several people in that channel can generally answer questions. Um, uh, okay, Zach because I asked name. a few times in SafDev, and uh, that sort of went into a blank stare. But maybe the IRT channel is a little bit more uh, vibrant on uh, on this. Yeah, or if you yeah. just mention a specific person to get their attention, we can help direct you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll try. Okay, yep. that's one. And the other one is is that, and this is sort of like uh, since a while, uh, I'd like to add something to the release notes. On, on well, my aim was for Luminous, mm -hmm. but that's only uh, another week. Yeah, and I add something like a note there, but there's only one thing I'd like to add, but it hasn't been merged, and that's the RBD G-Gate uh, daemon. Because that is actually the thing that got me started. Important to FreeBSD is that I can run a device that actually has an RBD image. So mm -hmm. I can run virtual machines on that. Uh, so you think I should just submit uh, a PR for the release notes and just squeeze it in there? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, you can definitely submit a PR for the release notes. Um, I'm not sure whether Gate makes sense to merge before we release, though. I haven't looked at it. I don't know if it's um, if it's something new that can break something else or if it's a totally separate. No, it doesn't break. It's it's actually 
completely outside of the tree, actually. I could even stick it into the FreeBSD uh, directory. But uh, the, the original author actually just put it into the, the RBD direct, directory as next to RBD MBD. Well, why don't, why don't you point out, put the pull request in the chat or whatever, we can look at it. Um, okay, yeah, so, sure. Yeah. And then... So yeah, Jason promised to look at it, but he's stuck up with all the luminous integration yep. stuff as well. So he, he sort of apologized for that. Yep. Okay, sure, thanks. Yep. All right, cool. Okay. All right, anybody else? All right, thanks everyone. Next month, first Wednesday of the month, it'll be September the 6th. Yes. Thank you, folks. Yep. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.